Okay, so we are talking about uh, lymph organs. And in, so, in last class, we have talked about lymph node, uh, the structure of the lymph node, and therefore different vessels in the lymph node, functions of the lymph nodes in our body, how they work uh, to support the immune system. Uh, today we will start the lymph organs. Uh, I have mentioned uh, the important differences between lymph nodes and lymph organs. What are the important differences between lymph nodes and lymph organs? Lymph nodes are small, round, solid structures, tiny, small, round, and present many in our body. Many lymph nodes are distributed throughout the lymphatic system in our body. Okay? So, uh, present in large number. Uh, lymph organs are only few in our body and they are much bigger than the lymph nodes. So that is number one. Number two, lymph nodes are solely responsible for immunity. But lymph organs have other important functions in our body. Okay? So lymph nodes are purely responsible, solely responsible for the immunity, but lymph organs have other important functions too. <clears throat> now, uh, lymph organs in our body are spleen, thymus, and tonsils. Uh, I didn't mention yet tonsils, so add that. Spleen, thymus, and tonsils. Those are lymph organs. First, we'll talk about the spleen. Spleen is the site of prolifer lymphocyte proliferation and immune surveillance and response. Those are the functions of the spleen. So, the lymphocytes proliferate, multiplies there. Okay? So, multiplication of lymphocytes occur inside the spleen. That is the proliferation. Uh, lymph uh, spleen also monitors the immune activity of our body. So it monitors the immune uh, activities of our body and then when requires the spleen we respond. Respond how? By increasing the number of lymphocytes, by proliferating the lymphocytes. Okay. So when our body needs more lymphocytes, immunity, the spleen will produce more. Uh, spleen cleanses the blood of AZ cells and platelets and debris. Uh, I have mentioned you that lymph organs are not only responsible for immunity, they have other functions. Now you see that the spleen has other functions beyond the immunity. Uh, it removes the old blood cells, platelets, and debris uh, from the body. You know that uh, two organs of our body are called as graveyards for red blood cells. We have talked about that, right? Graveyards for red blood cells, spleen is one. So, red blood cells, old red blood cells are uh, removed from the body in the spleen. After the blood cells are destroyed, platelets are destroyed, the dead cells are, or debris are removed by the spleen. Contains lymphocytes, macrophages, and huge numbers of erythrocytes. So those different types of cells are present in the spleen. Lymphocytes and macrophages, you know that those are related to uh, the immunity and <coughs> Red blood cells are also present inside the spleen because they die there. So that's about the spleen. <coughs> if you cut the spleen and see inside, you will see clearly, you will see two areas. Inside the spleen, you will see two distinct areas. One area looks white, whitish, that area is called white pulp. And another area is reddish. That 
area is called red pulp. White pulp area is located around the central artery of the spleen. And red pulp contains venous sinuses. Sinuses are the spaces, right? Sinuses are the spaces. So, why red pulp looks red? Because of the presence of sinuses. Because sinuses are filled with blood. Sinuses are the spaces filled with venous blood. Okay? So, that's why since blood is there, that area looks red. Here, you see, uh, inside the spleen, you can see those two areas, white pulp and red pulp. This is the central artery of the spleen. And around the central artery, this area looks white, and that is the white pulp area, because no sinuses are there. Uh, and around the vein, you see these are the venous sinuses, those are filled with blood. That's why any venous sinuses are present. That's why that area uh, looks red and called the red pulp. Okay. Uh, another li uh, lymph organ is the thymus. Uh, in early life, in very early life, the thymus is very large and occupies inferior part of the neck and extends into the mediastina. It actually occupies whole upper part of your thoracic case, whole upper part uh, of your thoracic cavity, uh, so big. And where it partially overlies the heart. So from the lower part of the neck, in infants, from the lower part of the neck, it goes down inside the thoracic cavity and uh, occupies most upper part of the thoracic cavity and even partially overlies the heart. Most active during childhood. You know that uh, the immunity in our body grows or develops slowly, right? Slowly. So in early life, uh, our body has less immunity, lack of immunity. That's why the thymus is big, because thymus is the organ for immunity, uh, lymph organ. So in early life, the thymus is very large to provide immunity. Uh, <coughs> then uh, the thymus gradually shrinks gets smaller and smaller and uh, in adults it is like a small this size uh, in the chest uh, below the neck uh, very small like their size uh, structure or organ uh, thymus consists of lobes many lobes are present those are called thymic lobes and if you cut the thymus, inside the thymus, you will find outer cortex and inner medulla. And cortex contains densely packed lymphocytes and scattered macrophages. So lymphocytes are heavily packed in the cortical area or in the cortex uh, and some macrophages. Medulla contains fewer lymphocytes. And but another important structure is present. One important structure is present in the medulla that is called thymic corpuscles. Okay. Or Hassel's. Another name, Hassel's corpuscle. And what's the function of Hassel's corpuscle? The function is the T lymphocytes get their training in the Hassel's corpus. That is the, um, so far we know, uh, function of Hassel's corpus. T lymphocytes, after the lymphocytes are produced, you know that um, they need their training, 
like you know, when we recruit the young kids in military, I have told you probably before, then we send to different camps, right, for different types of training. So uh, after the lymphocytes are produced, they are kind of naive. They don't know what to do. Then some lymphocytes will go to the thymus, some lymphocytes will go to the bone marrow, and we get that training. Some lymphocytes will get that training inside the thymus, some lymphocytes will get their training inside the bone marrow, okay? Those lymphocytes will go to the thymus, they will get their training in the facets corpuscle. Uh, that's so far we know uh, about the function of facets corpuscle. Uh, so they help in the, um, help the T cells to get their uh, training. Here, you see, uh, inside the thymus, uh, this is the outer part, cortex, and this is the inner medulla. Okay, first we'll see the outer cortex. Uh, as I have mentioned, that outer cortex has heavily packed lymphocytes. Many lymphocytes are there. That's why you see, since the cells are more in the outer part, that part looks dark. Make sense? Under the microscope, we see the area dark where most cells are, because the tissue is more densely present. Uh, in the inner side, inner medulla, we have few lymphocytes and vessels corpuscle or thymic corpuscle, and that is the location where T cells uh, get uh, matured. Okay, so that's inside the thymus. Now. Another type of leaf organs are tonsils. Tonsils are simplest lymphoid organs or lymph organs. Uh, important tonsils in our body are palatine tonsils, lingual tonsils, and pharyngeal tonsils. Okay. So those are uh, three groups of important tonsils in our body. Uh, palatine tonsils are present at the posterior end of the oral cavity. You know that the roof of your mouth is the palate, right? Palate is the roof of the mouth, and if you go behind the palate, the back part of the palate, uh, the palate and tonsils are there, uh, in the back of the palate. Uh, then lingual tonsils, lingual means tongue. Palatine indicates palate, lingual indicates tongue. So, lingual tonsils group at the base of the tongue. Okay? At the base of the tongue. Pharyngeal tonsils uh, are attached to the posterior wall of nasopharynx. You know that pharynx has three parts. Upper most, most part is the nasopharynx. And the posterior wall of nasopharynx um, where the pharyngeal tonsils are attached. If you see inside the tonsil, uh, uh, you see many crypts are present in the tonsil. Crypts are what? Crypts are foldings going inwards, towards inside the organ. So many inward uh, deep pores, foldings of pores are going inward in the deeper part. Those are called tonsillar crypts. This is just a small part they have shown uh, in histology. Uh, you will see many crypts are present in the tonsils. Those are called tonsillar crypts. And <coughs> lymphoid follicles. Lymphoid follicles are the round structures filled with lymphocytes. So lymphocyte filled, lymphocyte filled round structures. Those are the follicles and you'll see many follicles in the, uh, inside the tonsil. So just two important things here, tonsillar crypts and uh, lymphoid follicles. Germinal center, uh, what are those structures inside the follicles? You, by its name, you can tell, germinal center. The germinal indicates the area where 
cell, stem cells are there. Germ cells. Have you heard that? Germ cells. Germ cells are stem cells. So germinal centers inside the follicles, in the center of the follicle, uh, that is the location where the stem cells are present. Lymphocytic stem cells are present. So from there, uh, when we need more lymphocytes will be produced. Okay? So inside the center, in the center of the follicle, you will see the germinal centers. Okay, two important structures uh, present in the lymphatic system. We'll just talk about those two. One is pears patches. Pears patches are clusters of lymphoid follicles or aggregated lymphoid follicles. Where right? present in the wall of the distal portion of the small intestine, the leg portion of the small intestine. So aggregated lymphoid follicles or clustered lymphoid follicles in the wall of the late part of the small intestine. Similar structures are also found in the appendix. But appendix is known as very small finger-like structure like this attached to the cica. But small intestine is very long, right? Very long. So, uh, the pears patches are mainly present in the wall of the small intestine, but also uh, in the wall of the appendix. But appendix is a very small structure. That's why if you remove the appendix, uh, it won't uh, harm your immune system at all. Because, you know, just think that we have lymphoid organs and lymph nodes. So many, right, in our body, lymph nodes, so many lymph nodes. We have other lymphoid organs. We have large small intestine in the wall of the small intestine, aggregated lymphoid follicles, pairs, patches are there, right? So removal of the appendix will not harm as all, at all. That's why if we remove the toxin, it doesn't harm, right? And sometimes if toxin causes any problem, we remove them. Because we have a lot of lymphoid um, tissue everywhere in the body. Yes. Spleen also, right? Spleen, we remove the spleen, right? Splenectomy is common. Uh, so, Removal of uh, one or two lymphoid organs or uh, structures on theory in our immune uh, system. Uh, so uh, that's the pair patches. Lacteals. Uh, you know that if you see the wall of the small intestine, uh, we have finger-like structures, those are called villi. Some people say villi, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, finger-like structures in the inner surface of the small intestine, many finger-like structures. Those are called villi. And <coughs> this is inner side of the small intestine. This is the wall of the small intestine, okay? This is the wall and this is inside. So we know that nutrients are here, proteins, carbohydrates and fats are here uh, and inside the villi, blood vessels. Go like this, like arteries, branches of arteries and also Lymphatic vessels go there, okay, inside the villi. Now, uh, the lymphatic uh, capillaries, these are the lymphatic capillaries, <coughs> and the blood capillaries here absorb the blood capillaries, absorb the proteins and carbohydrates, those two types of molecules are taken into the blood, into the blood capillary. But the fat molecules are much larger than protein and carbohydrate molecules. And they cannot enter into the blood capillary because in the wall of blood capillary, we have very tiny holes. Those are smaller than most of the fat molecules, okay? So most of the fat molecules, they cannot go into the blood through the blood capillary wall. But in the lymph capillary, the wall has 
larger holes. So the fat molecules, most of the fat molecules will enter into the lymphatic capillary through the wall and will enter into the lymphatic system. So proteins and carbohydrates are taken into the blood directly from the small intestine, but most of the fat molecules enter into the lymphatic capillaries, into the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic capillary in the villi of the small intestine, those are called lacteals. So you know what are the lacteals and their functions. The lacteals uh, are the lymphatic capillaries in the villi of the small intestine and they help in the absorption of what? Fat molecules. Is it clear? They help in the absorption of fat molecules. Okay. Now, our goal is not taking the nutrients into the lymphatic system, right? That is not our goal. The nutrients should enter where? Into the blood. Nutrients should go to the blood. We have seen here that proteins and carbohydrates are going to the blood, but fat molecules, most of them are going into the lymphatic circulation, right? So, how they will enter into the blood circulation? You already know the answer. You know that finally, the lymph, that fluid is drained into the large veins at the junction of the internal jugular and subclavian. You remember that thoracic duct will drain the lymph and right lymphatic duct will drain the lymph at the junction of those two veins. Do you remember that? At the junction of those two veins. So uh, the fat molecules that will enter into the lymphatic circulation, finally it will be drained into the blood circulation, go to the blood circulation, right? Uh, in the venous blood, and so uh, it will go to the blood. Okay, so <coughs> that's the lacteal. Can you tell me again what the two arteries were the... Oh, the junction of... Yes. In, uh, at the junction of internal jugular and uh, subclavian. Okay. Uh, you, you, if you go back to your last lecture, you'll see that. Okay, here, uh, you see the wall of the small intestine, and you see many nicely organized lymphoid follicles, many lymphoid follicles. Uh, so, so, aggregated or cluster of lymphoid follicles in the wall of the small intestine, uh, mostly in the left part of the small intestine, those are the pierce patches. Okay. Now we we'll talk about the immunity uh, our body has the ability to fight against the antigen of foreign invaders the microorganisms or other antigens <coughs> that try to invade in our body. Our body fights against them. And that ability is called the immunity, or ability to fight against the antigens or microorganisms. So the system that supports the immunity of our body is the lymphoid system or lymphatic system, we have talked about that. Uh, now, today, uh, in this part, we will talk about different types of immunity or defensive mechanisms present in our body. Uh, two types of immunity present in our body. One is the innate immunity, another is the adaptive immunity. We will talk about those two types of immunity. Okay? Uh, how they work, how those different types of defensive mechanisms work in our body. We'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about the antibodies. Antibodies are the components uh, 
that helps the lymphatic system to uh, fight against the microorganisms. We'll talk about different types of uh, antibodies and their important properties. Okay. Uh, so then we'll talk about uh, cell mediated and humoral immunity. Uh, what are the cell mediated immunity? What, uh, what is the humoral immunity? Then we'll talk about active and passive humoral immunity. Those are two different types of humoral immunity. Uh, the cell mediated immunity. From its name, you can tell what is that. The cells will provide immunity. Cells will fight against the microorganism. Humoral indicates the chemicals, antibodies. So antibodies uh, provide the humoral immunity. <coughs> okay, so immunity is the resistance to disease. Immune system has two intrinsic systems. <laughs> In a defense system and adaptive <coughs> defense system, or innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is non specific, it will try to block or kill any kind of antigens or foreign invaders. It is not specific, it will try to block all kinds of uh, foreign invaders. Adaptive defense system or immunity is specific. That means it will be produced in our body to particularly fight against particular type of microorganism. Like if you get, uh, you know, uh, swine flu, right? Your body will produce immunity only to fight against that type of virus. Okay, uh, if your body gets different types of uh, different type of uh, microorganism, your body will then produce specific antibody or immune system uh, immunity to fight against that. That is the adaptive immunity or defense system. Now, innate defense system has two lines of defense. First line of defense is external body membranes, skin, mucosa, mucosal membrane, skin, those are the external membranes. Uh, another is, that is the first line defense of innate immunity. And second line defense is given by the proteins, antimicrobial proteins in our body, phagocytes and other cells. So phagocytic cells and other cells, those uh, will provide the second line of defense. Now, let's uh, see what are those. So one important information about the innate immunity is that we get the innate immunity by birth. Okay, everyone has innate immunity, we get by birth. When we born, when we born, we get that type of immunity. Everybody has that. Like the skin. All of us, we have what? Skin. Nobody will be born without the skin, right? So, the skin, we all of us, we have the skin. We have proteins. Some proteins in our body that fight against the microorganisms. All of us, we have that proteins, okay? Uh, phagocytic cells, macrophages, we all have in our skin and tissue have phagocytic cells. So those we get by birth or by born we get them. Adaptive immunity is produced in response to the microorganisms. Make sense? Like as I told you, if you get swine flu, then your body will produce immunity to fight against that, right? You are not getting it um, uh, Inheritably, you are not getting it. Okay. Uh, now, first line and second line defense, <coughs> those defenses of our body are given by the innate immunity. So, first line and second line defenses are given by the innate immunity. What are the first line defenses? Your 
external membranes, skin and mucous membrane. You know that inside your mouth, right? You have the mucosal lining. Inside your nose, you have the mucosal lining, right? And those are the members that also protect the body. So uh, that is the first line defense. Second line defense is antimicrobial proteins, phagocytes, and other cells. Just know that the proteins and phagocytic cells, those are present in our body. All of us, we have those second line defense too. Adaptive uh, immunity provides third line of defense. And uh, our body produces adaptive immunity in response to the foreign substances. When our body uh, is invaded by foreign substances, our body produces uh, produce that adaptive defense system or immunity. It takes longer to react than the innate system. Of course, because innate immunity is already in our body, right? Your skin, your uh, mucous membrane, those are already present. So they will immediately <coughs> stop. But the adaptive immunity takes some time because you can easily guess that when a particular virus or microorganism enters into your body, then your body has to make sure what is the structure of that microorganism, right? how to fight, all those things your body has to decide. And then your body, immune system, uh, 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 will be activated. Right? So that's why it takes longer time. Uh, adaptive immunity is given by T and B cells, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Okay? So those two types of lymphocytes provide the adaptive or specific immunity. Uh, phagocytic, uh, sorry, phagocyte mobilization. <coughs> How the phagocytic cells of our body respond to foreign invasion? If any foreign particles or microorganisms enter into your body, how the phagocytic cells will uh, react. Uh, here, I have shown uh, the properties of white blood cells. You know that neutrophils or monocytes, they are strongly phagocytic cells. Right? How they will react? Uh, first, when your body will invaded by microorganisms, then leukocytosis will occur. You all know that leukocytes are the white blood cells and cytosis means the production, right? So more white blood cells will be produced. Your body will produce more white blood cells. And neutrophils are the most powerful phagocytic uh, white blood cells. So, if this is the blood vessel here, and uh, if this is the site of infection, microorganisms are here, when the white blood cells will pass through the nearby uh, blood vessels, the phagocytic white blood cells will line up. Instead of passing through the blood vessels, they will get attached to the wall of the blood vessel and line up like this, and that is called margination they will get attached to the wall, inner surface of the wall of the blood vessels. And then, we know that in the wall of the veins or capillaries, we have the holes. And through those holes, they will try to get out, squeeze out through those holes. And what they will do, they will throw a small part of their cell membrane outwards, and then the fluid part will go to that side and gradually this side will get bigger, this side will get smaller, right? And uh, no, that is called diapedesis. Okay? So eventually they will get out. And that process is called diapedesis. Okay? And then after they 
get out, they start to move towards the site of infection, site of inflammation. The reason is microorganisms are there and they have to go there to kill them, right? To grab them and kill them. So, uh, who will guide them? Who will attract them to go there? Why they will move there, not here? The reason is, uh, at the site of inflammation, we know that some chemicals are released. Some chemicals are released there. So, that chemical will attract the white blood cells there. So, that is called chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the chemical attraction uh, okay, that will attract the white blood cells. Uh, we use chemotaxis to indicate attraction or opposite, repelling. That's why we use the term uh, positive and negative. Positive chemotaxis and negative chemotaxis. Positive chemotaxis will attract. Okay? Positive chemotaxis will attract. Uh, negative chemotaxis indicates that the cells will not be attracted. Okay? The signal will tell the cells, don't come here, go to the opposite direction, go other way. So that is negative. In this case, which one will want? Positive numbers because it will attract right, the white blood cells. And that is important. White blood cells should go there to kill the microorganisms. Right? So positive capotaxis is another uh, uh, step of mobilization. Okay. Uh, can, uh, can, did you, um, can you tell us what an example of negative digital salary, sorry? Uh, I didn't tell because it, uh, uh, it is not related to the immune system. Negative capitalism, she is asking me. Uh, yes. Negative capitalism occurs during the embryonic life, in very early life. A chemist, few cells, you know that one cell, right? <coughs> but there is A that multiplies and form the body, right? So, when the fertilized egg multiplies, some cells are sent to one direction, others to other direction, right? Uh, some cells will form your brain, some cells will form your heart, some cells will form your liver, right? So, they are sent to different direction. During that time, negative chemotaxis is more useful, okay? Uh, to tell some cells don't come this way, go to the other way, okay? So, in embryonic life with the development of the body or growth of the body and negative negative chemotaxis works. Okay. <clears throat> Adaptive defense. Adaptive immunity is specific as I have mentioned. It will be produced in our body to fight against particular or specific microorganisms. This system that means, once this immunity will be produced in our body, it will enter into systemic circulation and go everywhere in our body. Has memory. This is very interesting thing about adaptive immunity. Yes. What are vaccinations? Are they would they be adaptive or would they be? Uh... They will induce the adaptive immunity. Yes. Uh, okay, so the adaptive immunity has memories, that is why. Uh, if they are produced, adaptive immunities are produced in your body once, next time when your body will need that immunity, it will be produced very fast because the, your body immune system will keep that as a code that yes, I know how to fight against that, right? When second time, the same microorganism will enter into your body. Since your body immune system has that record, it will quickly, very fast, react to fight against that. Make sense? First time, your body learns. And keep that in your memory, memory of your immune system, lymphatic system. And then, second time, third time, if your body gets, it will react very fast. That's why 
we say that if you get particular type of you know uh, equation once, then second time the chance is less, right? We say that we got chicken box of that once, so chance is less. It makes sense. Okay. So uh, the reason is your body knows how to fight. So quickly, when the microorganism will try to invade, will fight and destroy. But still, there is chance. The chance is less. Yeah. Well, what would go wrong if the first time, if somebody did get it the second time? One of my sons got chicken box twice. Yeah, that's why I said that. So the chance is there. What What went wrong the first time? That. Nothing is wrong. Uh, probably the the uh, it is like fighting. If the microorganisms are strong, okay, they will win. It is like fighting. Okay, your body uh, learns how to fight, but still your body may lose, may not win. Right? That is the okay. uh, But chance is less. The reason is your body can produce quickly plenty of <coughs> antibodies or immunity, but it's still you. And also, it depends how strong your immune system, right? How strong your immune system is, and that is another thing. Like same invasion may not, uh, you know, uh, although you have that memory, just think that two people, both of you have memory. That uh, in the first time you got invasion, so you have memory. But if your body's immune system is stronger, it will get better. Right? All the both of you have memory. Mm -hmm. So uh, all those factors, how strong the immune system is. Okay. Uh, okay, now adaptive immunity has two divisions. Humoral immunity and cellular immunity. Humoral immunity is antibody mediated immunity. And cellular immunity is cell-mediated immunity. So in case of humoral, antibodies will fight against the microorganisms. And antibodies are produced by B lymphocytes. And B lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, produce small amount of antibodies. Small amount of amount of antibodies. And some B lymphocytes will be converted to plasma cells. Plasma cells. And plasma cells can produce plenty of antibodies. Plenty of antibodies lot of antibodies, the plasma cells, pl plasma cells can produce. Okay, so B lymphocytes can produce antibodies, but small amount. Some B lymphocytes will be converted to plasma cells, and plasma cells can produce lot of antibodies. Okay, that's how B lymphocytes help in the production of antibodies, and that is the humoral immunity, normal branch of adaptive immunity. Now, cellular branch of adaptive immunity is given by T cells. T cells will directly fight against the microorganism. They will engulf the microorganisms directly. They will cause the phagocytosis directly. They will not produce antibodies. Okay, so that's why this type of immunity is called cellular, cell-mediated immunity. And uh, I told you that after the lymphocytes are produced, right? after the lymphocytes are produced in the bone marrow, they are what? They're nine. They don't know. They're they are like, you know, fresh lymphocytes. They're not trained. <coughs> then some lymphocytes will go where? To the will remain in the bone marrow, and some lymphocytes will go to the hymen. You remember that? Hymen. And they will be trained there. Some lymphocytes will be trained in the bone marrow, inside the bone marrow. Those will be called now, after they get trained, they will get their, you know, their cells and so They will be called 
and B lymphocytes because they are K grad in the bone marrow, remember that, bone marrow B. And some lymphocytes, those will be trained in the thymus, those will be called as T. T is the first letter of thymus, remember, okay? So T, lymphocyte. <coughs> Okay. So B lymphocytes will learn to do what? B lymphocytes will learn to produce what? Antibodies. They don't know how to grab the microorganisms or kill them. They know how to produce and release the antibody. And T lymphocytes learn to do what? And go. Yes. Are equal numbers sent to the bone marrow and thymus? No, no. That that's not equal. Okay. And uh, that can vary, actually. It, don't like that. it depends on the need, uh, need of the body. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lymphocytes originate in the bone red bone marrow, you know that. And T cells get matured in the bone marrow, and T cells mat get matured in the thymus. And another thing here that uh, some B cells are converted to plasma cells that I have mentioned, and plasma cells will do what? Produce plenty of antibody. Some B lymphocytes will stay in your lymphatic system as memory cells. When second time, your body will get same uh, microorganism. Those lymphocytes, memory cells, will. Uh, trigger the system. Okay, here we have shown the same thing that I have mentioned that lymphocytes uh, are produced in the red bone marrow, and some lymphocytes will remain there, will get their training there, and some will be sent to the thymus and they get their training. And then those T and B lymphocytes will enter into your lymphatic system. Okay? So, into the lymphatic uh, system uh, inside the lymph. They will reside, they will house, get their house uh, in the lymph nodes, spleen, and other lymphoid tissues like pears patches or uh, other lymphoid tissues in our body. They will house there, they will uh, go inside and qualify it there. Okay? Uh, and we'll wait to kill the microorganisms. Uh, now, the humoral immunity that is given by the antibodies uh, could be active or passive. Okay, so active humoral and passive humoral. The active humoral immunity occurs when B cells encounter antigens and produce specific antibodies against them. And active humoral immunity could be naturally acquired and artificially acquired. So the main thing about active humoral immunity is that your body is actively producing antibodies okay, against the specific uh, antigens. Uh, naturally acquired active immunity. When you get microorganisms in your body, your body does what? Your body produces immunity, right? Against that. So that is active. Your body actively producing. Make sense? Your body is actively producing antibodies. So that is naturally acquired because the microorganisms are present in the nature, right? We are not inhaling intentionally. Make sense? We are not sending inside the body intentionally. It is going naturally. So natural uh, active humoral immunity. Now, artificial. That's what you are asking, right? Artificial active humoral immunity is vaccine. 
vaccine is not natural, we make it, right? So it is artificial. And we inject intentionally from outside. Make sense? Intentionally, we inject the vaccine from outside. And vaccine is what? Vaccine is highly attenuated microorganisms or dead microorganisms. I'm repeating again. Vaccine is what? Highly attenuated or dead microorganisms. Highly attenuated means almost dead. Okay? Highly suppressed or inactivated microorganisms. <coughs> that means if you want to uh, fight against someone, then if that person ties your hands and legs, would you be able to fight? No, you won't be able to fight. If the opponent ties your hands and legs together, you won't be able to fight. So what we do uh, sometimes, we make the microorganisms inactivate. We inactivate the microorganisms. Like you block the hands and legs of microorganisms. So now if you inject them inside the body, they won't be able to fight. Right? That is highly attenuated, highly inactivated microorganisms. They are definitely not able to cause any harm. We make sure that we have blocked all the harmful sites. That is one. Uh, sometimes we kill them and inject them into the body. Both will be able to produce or trigger immunity produce immunity antibodies in your body. Okay? So that is the artificially um, acquired uh, active humoral immunity. But in both cases, you see one thing, remember, your body is producing antibody, right? Your body is doing what? Producing antibodies. Okay? Just remember, that's why that is active. <coughs> Passive. Your body is not producing antibodies. We are giving antibodies to your body from outside. That means we are producing antibodies outside of the body and then giving to the person, to the patient or to the person. That's the passive. <coughs> now, passive could be also naturally acquired and artificially acquired. Naturally acquired, you know that when the fetus is inside the mother's body, mother's blood goes to the fetus, right? Mother's blood goes to the fetus. That's the fetal circulation. And the antibodies present in mother's blood we enter into the fetus body. That means fetus body is getting antibody from where? From outside, from mother's body, from another body. Fetus is not producing antibody, it's getting from outside. Okay? So that is natural, that is a natural process, right? Uh, we are not creating that. Another example, milk, mother's milk has antibodies and the baby gets the antibodies from the mother's body. So those are good examples of naturally uh, given or acquired passive tumor immunity. Now, Another type of passive humoral immunity is artificially acquired. Injection of serum. Large amount of antibodies. Like, good example would be uh, AIDS patient. What happens in AIDS? <coughs> AIDS patient's body cannot produce antibody, right? The immune system is destroyed. Cannot produce enough antibodies. In that case, what can you do to give antibody, uh, antibodies to their body? You can produce antibody outside, right? And then inject plenty of antibody into the patient's body. Make sense? Does it make sense? Like, if your body, just think that, if your body cannot produce antibody, then what will you do? You will get antibodies from outside and we inject large amount of antibodies into your body. So that is artificially acquired passive. 
your body, in both cases, getting antibodies from outside. That is the main message here. In case of passive, your body is getting antibodies from where? Outside. Make sense? In case of active, your body is producing antibodies. With your own antibody. In case of passive, those are not your own antibodies. You are getting from outside. But uh, uh, from outside you can get naturally or you can produce artificially in the lab and then inject. Okay. So, uh, you see uh, here the classification of humoral immunity. But if you go before that and classify the immunity, we know that immunity first we divided immunity into how many types two, two. very good innate and adaptive. innate and adaptive immunity innate we get what by Born. When we born, we get innate immunity, right? And innate immunity gives which lines of defense? First and second. Okay, good. And then adaptive is the immunity that is produced in our body. Produced in our body gradually and gives the or provides the third line of defense. Anyway, so. Which one is specific? Which one is non-specific? Name is non-specific. This is non-specific, right? And this is specific. Because this one is produced in response to specific microorganism. This one, example, is skin. That is not specific. It will block everything. Right? Try to block everything. So if it's skin or mucous membrane, they will try to block everything. So it is non-specific. This is specific. If I ask you which one is fast, which one is slow? Which one will develop slowly? The one that will develop, that is slow, right? This one. This one is already present in our body, so it will work all the time. Okay? Uh, which one has memory? Adaptive. adaptive. Your skin doesn't need memory, right? But adaptive one, uh, the lymphocytes. If you remember the memory cells, from the lymphocytes will be converted to memory cells. Which one, if I ask you, which one is given by the lymphocytes, T and B lymphocytes? Yeah. Adaptive. Right? T and B lymphocytes give the adaptive immunity. Who gives the innate immunity? Skin, yeah. Skin mucous membrane, right? The proteins in our body, antimicrobial proteins, macrophages, those give the innate immunity. You got the differences? Important differences. Now, <coughs> adaptive immunity could be how many types? What are those? Cellular and humoral. Cellular is given by which lymphocyte? Which lymphocyte? Cellular. T lymphocyte. And humoral is given by B lymphocyte. Humoral means antibody. So, which lymphocytes produce antibodies? T lymphocytes. Okay. So, cellular is given by T lymphocytes, and humoral is given by B lymphocytes that will produce antibodies. Okay. Now, humoral could be how many different types? Active and passive. So, active and Passive. Both are given by antibodies, right? Both are given by what? Antibodies. But in case of active, your body will produce antibody, right? In response to the microorganisms or whatever. In case of passive, the body is getting antibodies from outside. Okay, active could be artificial. Natural and artificial, natural 
that you see there and artificial okay artificial also uh, the passive could be natural and artificial okay now give me an example of naturally acquired active that means your body active means your body is producing in response to natural things like microorganisms right yeah, your body will develop, right? So that is natural. And artificial, when we inject vaccine, we are making the vaccine artificial, right? And then inject it, then your body is producing antibodies against that. So that is artificially acquired, active. Both are active, right? Your body is actively producing. And example of naturally acquired passive fetus gets mother's antibody, right? Fetus body is not producing, getting totally getting from outside, entirely getting from outside. Uh, from mother's milk, the baby is getting antibody, right? Uh, those are natural, artificial. If your body, your immune system is not able to produce antibody, even in response to vaccine, like if I inject vaccine into your body, your body immune system is not active. It cannot produce antibody against uh, uh, when you inject vaccine. Then what you have to do? You have to get antibodies from outside and inject directly into your body because your body is not able to produce antibody. Right? So uh, example is uh, if <coughs> someone's immune system is extremely weak, in that case you will inject the artificial uh, antibodies. Okay, so that is the classification of the immunity. Okay, now antibodies. What are the antibodies? We have talked about antibodies, antibodies, but what are the antibodies? Antibodies are proteins. A type of proteins? Immunoglobulins. One type of globuli. We know that plasma has different types of proteins, plasma proteins. Albumin, globulin, right? If we know them. So, antibodies are globulin, type of plasma protein, and that is called immunoglobulin, because those globulin provide immunity. And immunoglobulins are gamma globulin portion of blood, and secreted mainly by the plasma cells, as I have mentioned. That uh, B cells produce small amount, but plasma cells produce plenty of antibody. Capable of binding specifically with antigen. So, antigen will bind. Antibodies will bind with antigens and block them or inactivate them or kill them. Okay? So, to do that, they will bind with the antigens. The structure. Basic structure of an antibody, uh, G or Y shaped monomer of four looping big polypeptide chain. So if you see uh, an antibody, it will look like a T or Y and it has four polypeptide chains. Two chains are called H or heavy chains and other two chains are light or L. Okay? H chains are heavy chains and light chains are L chains. L chains are light chains. And immunoglobulin. Antibodies are immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins could be many different types. Important immunoglobulins are immunoglobulin A, M, B, G, and E. So A, M, B, G, and immunoglobulin we indicate by IG, immunoglobulin. IgA, IgD, IgE, IgA, and M. Okay, so five different types of immunoglobulins. Those are the major immunoglobulins. Uh, if you see the structure of an antibody, you see here four polypeptide chains. 
these two are heavy tests and these two are light tests. So these two are light, these two are heavy. Now, if you see, each shape has <coughs> two parts, constant part and variable part. Each chain has how many parts? Two parts. Constant part and variable part. The constant part will not change, but variable part will change. Why that change is needed? Many different types of microorganisms enter into the body, right? They try to enter into the body. And they are structured, they are different. Why you say different? Because they are structures of microorganisms are different. One microorganism look different than other, right? And your body, sometimes you know that new microorganism appears. They are never existed in the earth. You know, some new microorganisms are created, right? Uh, like swine flu, we didn't know about that. So, the microorganisms, they change their structure all the time. So how your body can fight against them? Since they change their structure, your antibodies should also change their structures to fight against them. Make sense? Your antibodies should make the change in their structures. And that is why the variable portion is present in the antibody. When it requires, the antibodies will change that part accordingly. First, it will, your body, your immune system will measure, like think this way, your immune system, when you get the new type of virus, your immune system will measure the shape, you know, size, all those information, and then we make this part, the variable part, accordingly, that we'll be able to bind specifically to that particular microorganism. Does it make sense? Okay. So, like, you know, if you uh, want to fight your enemy, uh, depending on the enemy, you will use the equipment, your gun. If you see many, then you will get different type of gun, right? If you see only one, uh, then you don't need heavy, you know, uh, gun. So our antibodies do that depending on the type of the enemy, they will change the variable part. And another example, the best way probably, uh, you know that the tools we use to unscrew something, right? The toolbox, you'll see one shaft, shaft part only one, and then you'll see different sizes of, you know, the top part, you change the top part, right? Uh, and then based on the shape of the screw, you can that. So the shaft part, you can say that is the constant part. And variable part, you are changing based on the shape of the enemy. You are changing to uh, inactivate that. Okay? So that's why the antibodies have the variable part. Uh, antibodies, just know the names, antibodies. Uh, what in different ways, three important ways uh, I have mentioned here, neutralization, neutralization, agglutination, and precipitation. Those are the main three methods or ways the antibodies inactivate the microorganisms. Okay. okay. Uh, neutralization, this is the antigen, microorganism or antigen, these are the antibodies. Uh, just know that uh, in inactivation, the antibodies will mask or block the harmful sites. Each antigen has harmful sites. Like if you want to fight, your harmful sites are what? Your hands and legs, right? 
Make sense? When you are fighting, your harmful sides are your hands and legs, right? Uh, uh, with those, you can harm some, someone. So the antibodies will block those harmful sites of antibodies. That is uh, neutralization, okay? And agglutination, in that case, antibodies will connect or attach a number of antigens together. It's like you have a long rope, you have a long rope, and you can tie a number of enemies and hold them together. Make sense? Like you are tying a number of enemies and tying them with a pole. So they won't be able to move, right? You are restricting their movement. They won't be able to go. So that is the agglutination. You see, uh, in this case, the red blood cells are considered as antigens, any. So antibodies are holding them together. So they won't be able to go. Precipitation. Uh, similar way, when a number of antigens are connected together, what happens? The whole, the weight of the whole structure increases, right? You are connecting them together, so the weight increases. So what will happen? There, they will go down, settle somewhere. They won't be able to freely move. Like you are tying many antigens together, so that weight will increase, will go up. Their movement will be restricted. Like if I put uh, 20 kilogram weight on your shoulder, or 40 kilogram weight on your shoulder, then your movement will be restricted, right? You will not be able to move free. So that is the precipitation. It will go down because of the increased weight. So just know that those three are the ways uh, the antibodies fight against the antigens. Okay? Do you have any questions?